didn't see me. What? I died. I died. That's him. Okay. It's so wrong that that was it. It was just like headlights and a half gas. Stop, stop. You're, you're confused. We had an accident. Oh my God, you're dead too. What? No. No, no, no. I'm not. And, and you're not. How do you know? Because I know. Well, because we're here. <laughs> and that's a clip from Wonder Darkly stars Sienna Miller. She joins us from an exotic bedroom somewhere. Uh, look a bit. Hello, Sienna. How are you? I'm good, Simon. How are you? Uh, well, I'm okay. And where do we find you? Are you at home? And I'm what? in London. You're in my bedroom. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. That's yes. I suppose that's that's one way of looking at it. Now, the last time we spoke was for American Woman. Yeah. I'm just trying to get the chronology of this clear. We spoke then about Twenty One Bridges. But I was reading at the weekend in the Sunday Times that you did 21 Bridges because Emily Blunt said after Wonder Darkly, which we're about to talk about, you should do something that people will see. Is that, is that right? So this is quite an old movie. It's, I'm slightly paraphrasing. We shot this in the summer of 2018, which feels about 20 years ago now, considering the last year that we've all had. And Emily is an amazing strategist and a great friend. And, and I just think what her point was was that it's good to balance, you know, more studio films with different kind of roles with the independent cinema, which I tend to, to do more of. And it was good advice. I'm obviously thrilled that I got the chance to work with Chadwick, who I miss horribly. So it was it was definitely the right decision. Yes, in fact, I, we are going to talk about Wanda Darkly, but Chadwick came in to talk about 21 Bridges and we ended up spending a lot of time talking about you. Uh, oh. And also uh, Martin Scorsese, but you're, but you're quite right, greatly missed. So... Wonder Darkly, you've already said this is uh, an independent uh, movie. I was going to do a couple of lines to sum it up, but then I thought, no, you explain it. Because it's impossible to explain. I yes. can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a very surreal, I'm, I'm actually just going to paraphrase the way other people have described it. It's okay. sort of eternal sunshine ghost, and it's kind of a Malick-esque cinematography. It's it's very dreamlike. It's a surreal story. The The film opens with a couple who had a baby who's about one and they're not having the best time in their relationship which is not abnormal i think under the stresses of new parenthood and they get into a car accident and my character thinks she died in the accident and to, and the only person that can see her is her partner played by diego luna and we kind of go on a journey back to the beginning of the relationship and see the moments where we went wrong I mean, and it's it's kind of an interior look at what grief is, which I think is a very isolating, solitary experience. And I think something everybody in the world can relate to at the moment. But it's also nostalgic and romantic and surreal. I think it's one of those movies, so it's best to know, I mean, obviously we're talking about it, we're promoting the film, you're promoting the film, I'm asking you about it, but it's best to know as little as possible uh, about it because after the opening exchanges and then there's, a, then there's the car crash and then you're dead, and then we go, oh, right, so oh, it's that kind of film. And then you go, oh, actually, it's not, it's not that kind of film. So I think it's fair to say you're either dead or you're delusional. And we're never, as times change and scenes change and our perspective changes, we're never quite sure whether our feet are on the ground or not. Is that fair? That's very fair. And I think that's what I liked about the script, because there are, there are twists and turns in it that I didn't see coming. And I love that. I love being fooled by something. Yes, you, you described it better than I did. So you can do the rest, <laughs> rest all. <laughs> or I'll just nick your words. I also think, and I don't want to put more words uh, into your mouth, that a lot of people will... I, I certainly watched this and I, and I enjoyed the film very much. And I thought this must have been incredibly difficult to make. And that be because because the perspective changes and the times change and sometimes we're back and sometimes we're forward and sometimes we're in the present. When you're looking at this script, Sienna, did it make sense straight away? The script really made sense and it was quite narrative the way that it was written. And I think I was so swept up in, in the romance of it and the, and the kind of grief of it. It was really beautifully articulated on the page and I could see it really clearly and didn't really consider technically how complicated it would be to make. Because as an actor, I really spend my time, as I think most actors do, trying to be as natural as possible. 
And there was no point of reference for being in a scene from the past and suddenly breaking it and commenting on it from the present. There's just, it doesn't happen in life. And so it felt quite clunky to do those scenes. And obviously it was an independent film with a lot of VFX that would be added later, but because it was low budget, I wasn't convinced that they'd work necessarily. And they do. But at the time that we were filming, there's a scene where we were in a garage and the garage starts to fill up with water and we look to the right and we're suddenly on a beach. But in reality, Sorry. there was a man with a hose pipe outside a garage spraying, <laughs> spraying water into the garage. And the director was saying, I promise you it's going to turn into a beach. And I was like, we have no money. This is just never going to work. And somehow she did an extraordinary job. And I think that visually it's, it's a real accomplishment on the small budget that we had. And and I liked how interior it was. Like I said, I think I like, it was grueling to shoot. It was exhausting. It was probably the most unhappy I've ever been making anything, but rewarding to see something come together. Okay. <laughs> the most unhappy you've been making anything. Yes. That's, that's quite a statement. Yeah. My unhappiest film. No, just as an experience, it was just relentless. And it was such a free fall. It was such a deeply painful experience. Not only what the character's going through, but having to hop between extreme grief and then, you know, half an hour after one of those scenes doing something that was really joyful. And I just felt really wrung out, I think, and actually finished this film and was was offered 21 Bridges while I was making this film towards the end of it. And I just couldn't, I was so exhausted. It was sort of 17 to 19 hour days on this that I couldn't imagine going onto a film that would be all nights. And it was about a week after wrapping that I would have to start that film. So I think that's what I, my hesitations were. Mm. And when, if you are, unhappy like that what do you what do you do do you go to the director tara tara May, do, do you do you talk to her w what happens if you're that unhappy you need or do you just talk to diego your co-star because he's fantastic do you talk it through when i say i was unhappy i wasn't it, it just i just meant it was challenging and i think that that hard movies are challenging this this is it was a punishing schedule and the director was phenomenal and diego was a total rock but it required depths that that were just exhausting to go to and and you know unimaginable kind of sadness in moments and and also levity and i think what you're left with at the end of the film is is something that's quite inspiring and uplifting again it speaks to the resilience of human beings and and i love that this film is is so honest that it's authentic about portraying a relationship it doesn't kind of gloss anything over but yes diego was a total rock as was tara although she was completely you know managing the schedule herself Yes, and so Tara Mill wrote and directed this movie, and part of this is her story. Can you explain a little bit about her story and, and how she came to write this in the first place? Yeah, she and her husband were in a car accident a few years ago, and they just had a new baby, and they were both all right, concussed. And I think a few days later, she was lying on the sofa, similar to a scene in the film, and she looked at her baby and she called to her baby, and her baby completely ignored her. And for a split second, she thought, what if I died? What if this is some kind of fantasy or some afterlife? And from that one moment, she wanted to write a film, which she did. And she says that about, I don't know, six months after the accident, they were at Thanksgiving and everybody was screaming and fighting over the turkey and it was messy and chaotic. And, and she just wanted to bottle the, lo the love and the joy. She felt at how transient life can be, at how quickly, if they hadn't survived that accident, none of this would have existed. So something you might normally not really notice, she was incredibly grateful for, even though it was messy and and she wanted to bottle that feeling into a film. So the fact that it's her experience, she's written and directed it, was there a part of you that was trying to be her? Yeah, initially I wanted to, I definitely can see elements of her in what I did. I tried to let it go as we went on because it was really distracting and it just added a layer of pressure that I already felt. I think, you know, the film was it was so her that she could answer any question and that having that point of reference was really useful. But I see that there are mannerisms that I did. I think I studied her before we started shooting and, and let it go once we began. But I see it in there. Diego Luna is your as your co-star is and you describe him as, you know, as a rock. But the things that you go through and you go through pretty much everything in this story together, it's really, really intense. The rehearsal time that you got for this movie, first of all, is it true that you got rehearsal time? And I would imagine that you, that would have been rare on a on an independent picture, but absolutely vital. 
it was essential and we did get about eight days rehearsal time which you know i've done films that are 250 million dollar budget and you've never said a word to the actor before your first day and you're suddenly you know it's a huge responsibility to make an enormous film but very little time is spent on the thing that actually makes a film magic i think which is performance often so this was a real joy and thank god because it was such a technical thing to shift as we talked about between time zones and and also it, it required us to really trust each other i think to go to those emotional places and to have some sense of history between us so the, the rehearsal really became like a bit of a therapy session for us all and i think we all revealed quite deep truths about our past and our relationships and therefore went into this with a sense of intimacy that i think you feel between us we'd known each other before diego and i when he had e tu mama tambien come out i had a film called factory girl come out and it was the first time that i was in something that was kind of buzzy and exciting and we got to go to hollywood for the first time mm. and you know behave badly at fun parties together and so i don't think i don't think you're that kind of actor no no but you know i was 22 and it was great and he was the same and and so it was our first our first experience of hollywood was sort of shared and so we'd had a friendship and had been looking to do something so there was a trust that existed thankfully so you're exhausted at the end of this movie but going on to make 21 bridges at least it's like a linear story you know what one scene follows the next in a relatively straightforward way yes yes although i i had so little time to prepare for that and that would have been really fun prep to spend time with proper cops and narc detectives and drive around new york city in their car and chadwick got to do a lot of that and i I think I had about nine days to nail a Brooklyn accent and, and you know, switch from Adrian to a uh, narc. So I see, <laughs> I wish I'd had a little bit more time to play before I started shooting that. But at the same time, I got to work with a legend. And yeah. yeah. Did you know it was Paulie? Because it occurred to me when he came in to promote the movie, he must have known then that he was sick. I didn't know. I, don't, I think very, very few people did. And I wouldn't have known because of his professionalism and strength. But in hindsight, looking back, he was very, very thin. And when we went to reshoot, he was even thinner and he was very tired, which you would never know because he's, I can't believe what he did, knowing what I know now um, that he was battling this. But I think he loved to work and there was something life affirming about, about doing the work. And he produced this film and was involved in every aspect and just the most elegant, dignified, brilliant man. Yes. Why are always the best ones? Oh, devastating. Yeah. Uh, you seem to be getting offered fantastic movies, as we said when you came in. American Woman was was a terrific movie. Is it is it true? I was just reading about Anatomy of a Scandal. Is it true you got COVID at Christmas? Yes, I did. How did it affect you, Sienna? Um, you know, it wasn't dreadful. It was not great, but I, I certainly have fared relatively well. I've had the flu once before in my life and I feel like I was much worse with that flu than okay. this. I, you know, I was tired. I couldn't taste or smell anything on Christmas day, which was probably the worst, the worst of it. That's one of the best bits about Christmas is all the food, but you know, thankfully we got through relatively unscathed and was unwell for a week and that was it. And what's it like filming and working in a COVID set? There's, it's such a joy to have somewhere to go and to be able to leave home and go and be around people and be creative. You know, I feel so deeply for people who aren't able to do that. So I'm incredibly grateful for that experience. At the same time, it's surreal. Everybody's in masks and goggles and, you know, we're quite a tactile bunch. There's none of that. But at the same time, they're doing an incredible job of keeping it safe and we're, we're managing to we're almost at the end of a five month shoot and have not had to shut down. So we're doing well. And is that what we see you in next? Is Anatomy of a Scandal next from you? Yes, that is the next one. That should be out. I, I'm not sure exactly when, maybe the end of this year. It's the people that made The Undoing and Big Little Lies. So it's their next show. And it's fun to work in a six hour format. I really like watching those limited series. And they obviously know what they're doing. They're brilliant creators and a brilliant director, S.J. Clarkson. and. What's strange about it, though, is I've done one other limited series, The Loudest Voice, and we shot that episode by episode. This one, we're, sh we're cross-shooting. So my first scene was actually the penultimate scene of episode six, the last episode. So it's quite a lot to map six hours of drama, and, and I hope that it all works out well. But it, at least you won't be in a garage being hosed by a guy and then having to step out and it turns into a beach. Yes, although there are tricks in this one. There are a few, <laughs> but no hose fights. Uh, Sienna Miller is the star of Wandered Darkly. Uh, Sienna, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me.